Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of SAE Government Technologies uh, LinkedIn Live event. This is our third event this year. Today, we'll be talking about modernizing defense acquisition operations. I've got a couple of guests that are uh, very well uh, versed in defense acquisition. We have uh, Adam Rensselaer, the CEO of Valid Eval, and we have Ben McMartin, a senior fellow of George Mason University. And uh, Ben is a consultant in the defense acquisition space. Again, my name is Mark Pickett. I'm the Technology Transfer Program Manager at SAE Government Technologies. Gentlemen, welcome. Great to be with you, Mark. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Adam. How you doing, Ben? I'm doing great. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for joining. Um, so today we're talking again about modernizing defense acquisition operations. Uh, Valid Eval is a secure software as a service platform for organizations that make and defend tough decisions. It stream, streamlines complex group evaluation processes that can involve hundreds or even thousands of subjects, domain experts, and judges. It makes the experience easy, efficient, inclusive, educational, and fair, rewarding participants, ensuring defensible outcomes, and generating valuable data. I know that SAE Government Technologies worked with Valid Eval uh, on a competitive solicitation for energy storage. Uh, we worked with them again uh, late last year when we ran a tech scouting competition. And we chose Valid Eval because of their elegant evaluation tool, strong relative past performance. So Adam, please give us a little bit of background on yourself and, and tell us from your perspective what, what Valid Eval is all about. So I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been uh, I've been doing the uh, the startup founder thing for most of my 29 year career, and Valid Eval began as scratching an itch, and the itch was that I was charged with uh, getting judges together uh, for uh, pitch competitions, and it really irked me that I would have all of these amazing venture capitalists and angel investors from my community here in Denver, Colorado. Uh, impaneled, fire hosing the entrepreneurs down with wonderful oral feedback, and no one was learning a freaking thing. From my perspective, I had invested 12 person days in that endeavor, 12, 12 very valuable person days to come in and sit in judgment of all these entrepreneurs. And the fact that nobody got anything out of it, nobody's business improved, really, really bothered me. And uh, I, I have a, a, a very old friend who is a professor of education, his PhD is in a field called the learning sciences. And I was crying and crying in my beer one day uh, about this problem with him. And he said, oh, well, what's this pitch thing you people do? And being an academic, you know, he'd never been exposed to the fundraising process. So I explained and he said, oh, well, that sounds like a complex performance to me. And I had to think about it for a beat. And yeah, you know, solving a problem that's never been solved before, standing up a company around that, and then convincing a room full of skeptical people that yours is the shiniest and best company most worthy of funding is as complex a task as I can imagine. So I said, yeah, it's a complex performance. That's that's absolutely what this is. And he it was his turn to pause a beat. And he said, well, you know, in my field, we've had a best practice for assessing complex performances for a couple of decades. And it turns out that just by simply using this thing called the rubric, which folks younger than I have had as part of their formal education. It, this is not a mysterious instrument. It turned out that uh, 12 years ago, no one had ever deployed a rubric to assess a startup company strategy. So wind the clock forward three or four years, we founded a company. Uh, the third co-founder in uh, is a user experience expert because all this high-minded science doesn't amount to a hill of beans if it's not incredibly easy to use. So uh, from the jump, we've endeavored to bring consumer grade user experience with no training required to the party. Uh, and then all of this is underpinned with uh, with with the appropriate science. Um, and uh, yeah, that that was that was the genesis of what we're up to. Awesome. And you're not talking about a six sided cube rubric. You're talking about an evaluation criteria that you use. Yeah, ru rubrics and rubric are, are a little, <laughs> little different. <laughs> Got it. Hey, Ben. Uh, Again, thanks for joining us. Uh, please give us a little bit on your background and, and what you're doing these days. Sure. So I, I started my background a long time. I grew up in the Denver area. Adam, I don't know if Adam knows that or not. Um, grew up in the Denver area, moved to Michigan. Um, 
my background is in commercial transactions and litigation, um, which I thought was going to be my career path did not end up being my career path. I, my career path ended up going through this weird world of, of defense contracting. Um, I worked at Army TACOM at a place called TACOM Contracting Center, which is now Army Contracting Detroit Arsenal, um, and found my way over to the R&D world where I was acquisition manager for TARDEC, which is now the Ground Vehicle System Center. Um, and, so, and so, and now I find myself on the outside doing a number of studies on the academic side and advising mm -hmm. companies as well. Um, and left DOD in 2019 to become managing partner of the public spend forum. And so ultimately my background is in, is in the contracting portion of a defense procurement, specifically in emerging technologies and R and D. I certainly did all the other kind of stuff you can do in contracting supplies and services and major systems and all that. Um, but I liked R and D. R and D was fun to me. That's what I like to be in. I like uh, I like to get uh, proposals of a bunch of crazy ideas, and, and none of them look alike. And each procurement on its own is is different and unique, and 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 fun to do. Um, and so that sounds like it should have no application whatsoever for Adam and his rubric. But the reality is that it has all the application for Adam and his rubric in that all this custom criteria ultimately is just um, is just factors that can be factors that can be laid out in a scheme to make it easy, logical and fair for people to evaluate. I've uh, I've been in multiple roles on a lot of source selections, source selection being that DOD ritual, I call it. Um, that has a lot of paperwork behind it. Um, and, it. and I've served in every role you can serve in in the DOD source selection from the contract specialist, worst role to be in the source selection, doing all the paperwork, to the contracting officer, to the source selection boards, team leads, advisory council, and even the selection authority. And in all those roles, um, it's amazingly haphazard. Uh, it's, very, it's not very consistent. Um, criteria on every buy changes and, and some criteria and different buys doesn't change, but it's applied differently. And, um, and so, you know, I, I've struggled through that process for more than a decade, um, and seen it, seen it done poorly, seen it done well. Um, and then I came across Adam and his tool recently and I said, yes, this is what we've been asking for. This is this is exactly what we've been asking for. By the way, I created Adam's product way before Adam created his product. Um, I created this in 2009 working for the Army. I created it using a program called Microsoft InfoPath, okay? Um, and, and used it on a procurement and had my, my engineers at the time for this procurement use InfoPath to do their assessments in it. Now, admittedly, it was, it was way more work than it was worth, you know, because I, I wasn't as sophisticated as Adam and, and what he's done with Valid Eval. But, but I've always loved this concept. I've always wanted to get to this concept. And, and I've seen multiple entities at the federal level and in the commercial world use this concept super successfully, but they've never had the, they've never had the tool where they can just say, give me that off the shelf. I'm going to use it. So what, what um, I know that was a little bit of, that was a little bit of pitch for Adam, but I wanted to make sure I could dig him on the fact that I invented your thing. Like, I didn't realize you were going to get into IP infringement this morning. <laughs> well, so, so Ben, wind the clock back, man. What, uh, what possessed you to try to invent that thing yourself? What, what was the itch you were trying to scratch back in the day? Uh, so, so what I found was I had, I had a procurement with this specific procurement. I won't say what technology was, but we had 30 some offers. This is a true R and D effort and it had a big upside production um, effort. So we're talking about prototypes that are around the $9 million range. And we're, and we're talking about a production level that's going to be in the billions. Yep. Um, and so I've got, I got a lot of interested parties. There's a lot of upside. You can build an entire business for decades on this, on this prototyping effort. 
Um, and they're writing 100, 150 page proposals, technical proposals. Um, and I've got 30 companies doing that. Okay. Then I'm turning over to my engineers and saying, good news, we got 30 proposals. And of course, that's never good news to anybody that you got 30 proposals because right. that's a lot of work. Right. And so now I'm going to apply this very small criteria that we created against a super sophisticated problem across 30 different proposals that they don't come in consistent. This is prototyping, right? Yeah, they yeah. come in inconsistent. And so right off the bat, I, I'm getting these preliminary evaluations and they're all inconsistent. Yeah. Oh, I thought that word meant this in the factor. I thought it was this way. I thought the weighting was different. Oh, I thought the weighting was a totally different way. Yeah. And so I've got a team of engineers that cannot agree whatsoever on what the factors actually are, how they should be applied, how they should be weighted. Yeah. Um, and and I said, I need some standardization. We're never going to get through this without standardization. And, and so ultimately, that's what I set out to produce, yeah. right? a, a standardized rubric where, hey, all you need to do, engineers, come in here. Here's what the factor is. Here's the information I'm asking for. You fill in a block. And InfoPath allowed me to, to block them into a form, right? Hey, wow. you need to fill in this form, and this is the criteria right. you need to use. Um, and it sounded good. It, it, was, it was a little laborious at the time with the technology, but that was the concept. Well, it's, it's funny, Ben, because one of the things that, that we are very focused on is standardizing vocabulary. It's crazy how much that matters, yeah. right? I mean, you, 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 you say a word and it's crazy how differently folks can interpret it, particularly if it's a term of art, right? I mean, and in DOD world, we throw around so much lingo. And the mission for many of our uh, federal customers is to increase the participation of the private sector. And if you've got all this crazy inside baseball government speak, how the heck is industry supposed to understand that? Well, it turns out if you actually explain what you mean in black and white, like layperson terms, they're going to understand. And the same is true for your expert evaluators. Yeah. I, I, the other piece on that, and I totally agree with that. The other piece on that is for some agencies, not all of them, but for the army in particular, the army is prohibited from using a numerical scoring. This is, and, and some people don't understand this. So, in NASA, at NASA, when you do a source selection, you use a numerical score. You get a big sheet and it says, did it have these 20 things? And there's a points next to it. And you and you put numbers in. Yep. And then there's then there's some more qualitative stuff at the bottom, but you apply a number against the qualitative criteria as well. And at the end, you get a score. And guess what? Best number wins, right? And that's how that's how NASA works. Well, um, for Army and for other agencies as well, they've decided that adjectival rating is the only way that you can do it. And you are prohibited from using a scoring. Yeah. Um, so you get in this world where you're like creating a fiction that you can somehow qualitative, purely qualitatively assess something yeah. without providing any kind of numerical ranking to it, which is uh, super challenging to do. It's a wrinkle, um, isn't it? It's a wrinkle because ultimately what happens is it gets translated to numbers and then translated back to, to well, words. That's right. And no, no, nowhere in those regs is it written that the software engineering behind it can't use numbers because, of course, software loves numbers. It, it is numbers <laughs> at the end of the day, right? It's all zeros and yeah. ones if we go if, if we go all the way down to the bottom of the pile of turtles. <laughs> sure. And it has to be. And, yeah. and the reason for actually titles is that it allows for this flexibility, right? That's right. Um, it allows you to say, okay, this one was scored a 99 on the NASA mm -hmm. scale, and I'm going to award it instead of the 100 on the NASA scale. So, so it allows you this flexibility to make this qualitative judgment at the end that I'm going to go with the lower score because. Yes. Um, now, that shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen if you've weighted your factors correctly. If you've assessed your factors correctly, you should end up where you're supposed to end up. Um, but it's a challenge. These are super complex assessments. That's and right. so, and, and so that's what I love about having a tool that doesn't come in and try to simplify everything. By the way, my info path tool had a scoring too, and it was, it was remedial at best, right? Um, excellent equals four. Good equals three. I, I, I mean, I mean, very remedial math. Um, 
I was an English and history major, and then I went to law school, so um, didn't do a whole lot of math in my life. Uh, so I did what I could do with the math, but that's what I love about having a tool like your tool, which is ultimately, let's take something really complex and let's simplify it, which is the art, right? The art is to simplify the complex. And, um, and, and that's the key. The other piece is the reporting. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm dominating this conversation, Adam. I'm sorry. Sorry you showed up. But reporting is Poor key. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, you have to report these things. You make evaluate, you write up evaluations. Evaluations have to go into a, a roll-up write-up. The roll-up write-up goes into an advisory, uh, advisory council memo. Advisory council memo goes into an SSA determination. Um, of course, I'm speaking from the Army kit context here, but you have to write, you have to write up, you have to defend, you have to report. And um, the idea that we're going to redo those, or they're all going to be these Word documents that we redo, which is reality. Um, it's nonsense. We should be able to report out of a tool that shows us what the metrics are and how it, and how we ended up. And uh, another reason why you need, you need a, a tool like Valve. Yeah, for sure. Um, so let me try to put a bow on all that that was just, <laughs> it was just stated. Um, and, and let me take care of an administrative thing that I forgot to do at the beginning of this. This is LinkedIn live event, but this is actually pre-recorded because we had trouble getting these rock two rock stars together at the same time. So we had to we had to do it today and it'll publish next week on the 7th of March. Uh, if you do have a question in the audience, you can send it to my email. We will get back to you. My email is mark.pickett on the screen here at sae-itc.org. All right, Adam and Ben, what I heard is that acquisition decisions are very complex. It involves a lot of paperwork. It involves a lot of human time, uh, man days to actually go through the process and, and, and make sure. And, and I would not want to be an acquisition professional. Tremendous pressure, um, very, very complex decision making, very critical programs to government agencies. And if we're talking about the Army, you think about the warfighter and the acquisition process of, of tools and equipment that they need to, to, uh, to do their job and defend the country. Uh, so, you know, very much high pressure. And they go through those acquisition uh, wickets because they're trying to make sure that they can defend their decisions. And, 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 and so I think that this tool, what I'm, what I'm hearing is that it, it, it's a time saver. It saves time and money. Um, and you can take these complex decisions and you can distill those down into uh, a very simple process that is standardized. So the process is standardized but you can customize the rubric and the evaluation criteria for every single acquisition that you do. That's so right. it's, it's not trying to put a square peg into a round hole. The process is standardized, but the evaluation criteria and the rubric is customizable. Adam, maybe speak to that a little bit. Sure, no, I think you, you put your finger on it really accurately. Um, so at this point, we've developed more rubrics than anyone in the world. Um, right around 270, 275 deployed to date. And by this week, that whatever the number is, will increment by, by one more. Um, so it turns out that the entire process is anchored around whatever the criteria are and how they get distilled into this rubric, which is just a matrix, right? So um, the getting that right and getting that right early in the process is key. If you do that and you do it well, two things are true. Commander's intent has been accurately codified and captured in that document. That's thing one. Thing two is that industry and all the stakeholders clearly understand what the program's intent is. And they don't need any handholding to do so. So if you can affect that, and I'd, I'll, I'll assert that, that we've done pretty well at, at doing those two things. If you can't affect that, something pretty magical happens. Now, all of a sudden, the very busy commander can kind of dance out of the way and let all of the experts, all of the appropriate stakeholders from across SAE's ecosystem, from across the Army ecosystem, whatever it happens to be, all of those people can come in and participate in a consumer grade user experience where all they have to show up with is their hard earned expertise. And then they get to do something that's actually pretty fun which is to consume all these really cool disparate proposals like you talked about earlier, Ben. It's really fun to see how different people solve your problem. And there's a lot of creativity and, and that, that aspect can be really fun. And so if you can take the drudgery out of this 
And if you can make it really efficient, then it's easier to recruit these experts. And furthermore, one, one of the other things that, that happens, and this is kind of a, a, a sneaky bit of our process that, that is not very well understood outside of the, the, the world of our customers, and that is that there's a sneaky column in the rubric that actually are the application prompts for every single thing that that commander has decided is important. Those application prompts then in turn guide the writing of the proposal or whatever the performance artifact is. Uh, in the case of uh, one, one of the uh, DOD organizations with whom both Ben and I work, um, the artifact is a movie. And the instructions to industry are, hey, go shoot a seven, eight minute movie. Um, here are the guidelines for that. It doesn't have to be of high quality. You know, your iPhone is a great movie making tool for this particular assignment. You don't need to hire a production crew. Go get after it and tell us your story. And then in that way, everything is in lockstep with what that initial commander's intent is. And the commander comes back at the end with all of the data from this process. And then it is and must remain, in my opinion, a very human decision. This isn't like 100 wins no matter what over 99. Mm -mm. The contracting officials and the, the, the program plank holder have the ultimate say as to what is actually going to get chosen, same as it ever was. So in that sense, nothing new is under the sun here. What, what's different is that in capturing and codifying commander's intent and doing that thing well, you can now have a much broader stakeholder base to help inform your decisions so that all of the relevant voices have a seat at the table. Yeah, good point. Ben, you, you have a comment or no? Well, I, I'm afraid to give I, you the floor again. Yeah, I, you should be afraid. OK, <laughs> first of all, I'll say that I forgot my disclaimers, which is I, I am not paid by valid eval. I know no equity in valid eval. However, if Adam wanted to push me some shares for this amazing pitch I've given for him, I will accept. All right. Um, so the standardized rubric piece um, is so key. Uh, what we're talking about, the value prop here of this, is that the evaluation piece is the long pull in the tech, with the exception of requirements development. So um, requirements development no, no question the longest pull in the tent for, for big systems. I'm talking about big systems here, right? Um, after that, it's evaluation. And now evaluation always gets wrapped up into, you know, quote unquote, contracting. But contracting is a very small part of that timeline. The timeline is evaluation. And so I've been on source selections where requirements development takes six months, let's say, if it's a really big system. Um the source selection, not the contracting, meaning choosing who we're going to contract with. I've been locked in a room for, for up to a year on a yeah. procurement. Okay. That, that is a year of your life working on one thing, yep. going over evaluations, rewriting them, yep. asking why you wrote them that way. And, and at the end of it, then you have to do the contracting. Yeah. Um, so ultimately what happens is the customer comes back to you as the contracting folks. And he says, it's been a year and a half. Where the hell is my contract? I yeah. gave you the requirement back here. What's happening. And from a contracting perspective, you're like, wait a minute. We spent a year of that with you choosing who we were going to contract with. I, I did my part once we chose them. Right. So the evaluation part is the long pull in the procurement tent. Requirements development is always going to be its own piece. Um, but if you're able to go out with a problem statement and say, you know what, I'm not going to spend a year figuring out what the requirement is. This is the capability, capability gap I'm trying to fix. Let's get into that evaluation part. Right? Yeah. And, then, and then use a tool to, to streamline that and get to the contracting part yeah. of it. So I, 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 I often wonder if people recognize the value prop of cutting down on the evaluation phase and what a massive piece of fault it is. Yeah. Um, it is the piece in a, in a FAR procurement, federal acquisition regulation procurement or DFARS procurement. It is the biggest piece because at the end you make a war. Yeah. 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 In an OTA other transaction authority, maybe it's not as big because right. you, 
because you're going to negotiate afterwards right. and that's going to take some time. But yeah. it, it is the majority of, of procurement and administrative lead time. Well, let me let me I'm, I'm going to put another uh, this is risky, Mark, but I'm going to put another nickel in with with Ben because because I'm, I'm curious about that. I'm curious about that. <laughs> Um, so we we have a hypothesis that so right now let's let's situate everybody in, in terms of what valid eval has been up to right so we have been playing at the at the at the early stages of TRL right so most of our federal government customers right now are dealing with SBIR innovation programs uh, our relationship with SAE is just beginning and we're really excited to do some great things there but the name of the game for us is to start to climb up more towards sustainment and more towards these big programs where lots of people are locked in a room, Ben, where maybe some bad pizza gets shoved under the door from, from time to time. But, but make no mistake, you're not leaving until, until you come out with that decision a year later, right? So yeah. in, in that environment, um, I've heard uh, Lauren Knausenberger from the Air Force and, and others claim that there's about a year spent on this thing which is principally about protest defense, right? It's it's my hypothesis, and you've been in those rooms, Ben. I haven't. I've 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 always been on the private sector side. So, in those rooms, what percentage of your time would you say is spent in defense of potential protest, rather than determining which of these proposals is the most fit? Yeah, that's a man. That is a great point, and, and I'm going to give you two different answers, though. OK, because, again, this is very dependent on what you're buying um, in a professional services recompete. Let's say I'm going to do a billion dollar buy of the next you know, on site support for for overseas. And it's going to be, you know, 2000 bodies in Afghanistan or something. Um, I know what that requirement looks like. So requirements development is easy for me. It's going to go quick, right? It's do the yeah. thing I did last year. Same as the last year. contract with yeah. a recompete. Yeah, yeah. Do, do that thing again, yeah. but do the recompete on it, right? So what am I concerned about? I'm concerned about probably driving down price because I've already bought it once. I, I fleshed out the risk on it. Um, and then I'm going to go, and then what am I going to assume because it is a support services contract I'm going to assume protest is 100% and it should be 100% because there is no risk in an incumbent not protesting a service if they lose it. There's zero. And, and if they do, they honestly give up six months of, a, of, of that protest time in which their people are still working. So if I'm a shareholder in that business, I'd say, why the hell are you not protesting right now? I know everyone hates that. It feels dirty. But why are you not protesting? You could be getting six months of this giant contract going. On. So in those buys, people know it's a protest. So it's not a big impact in, in terms of you know, like the protest is coming. You know, it. Um, in a hardware buy, it's a different story. I am trying to avoid that damn protest. I got to get hardware out in the hands of somebody. I don't have time for this. Right. Um, and so in those in those uh, situations, I do an initial eval. God, that initial eval ends up looking pretty much like the final eval. Um, I do some revisions to it. I make it bulletproof. I document, I document all day. I stay on the weekends and just document things to document them. And I become invincible. I create an invincible contract fund, right? And how do I do it though? I muscle it. I throw more people at it. I throw more hours at it. I throw more documents at it. And I make myself bulletproof. Now, the, the downside of this is I am going to win that protest. The government's going to win the protest. And, and the statistics show that they will. Um, it's very rare that they're going to lose the protest. But at what cost? Yeah. I'm going to be in the room for a year. All I'm avoiding is a 100-day protest, right? But I'll tell you, I tell you though, that it's <laughs> we, we should be so lucky if it's a 100-day protest, right? I mean, uh, think, think we should be. The fueling program for, for the Air Force, right? From and and the, often there's these corrective actions that, yeah. in effect, you know, say that the government won, but they reset, right? Yeah. And so I didn't really buy anything. I reset and I'm, I'm changing something or I'm redoing the procurement or I'm doing a bridge contract to the incumbent while I figure out how to correct what I said I was going to correct the GAO. Um, so to your question, though, uh, Adam, depending on what type of buy it is, 
making things bulletproof takes up a lot of time. And those final evals end up looking a lot. I mean, I'm talking post-competitive range, right? Yep. So um, post-competitive range, you're down to three or four companies. It is what it is. They're not going to make major changes on, on FPR. They're, they're going to come in pretty close to where they were at. You're going to have some adjustments. But those evaluations are going to look pretty much very similar on post-competitive range through final. But that might be six months post-competitive range to final. You're just making them bulletproof. Um, if that's something that you can report out of a system, holy crap, have you saved yourself a lot of time. Um, and, and there, I know there's another feature to valid eval. I don't know if it's going to come up or not, so I'm going to fire it out and then I'll pass it back. But one of the features that I like, and, and this is because of my experience um, with dealing with big evaluation teams, is evaluators are not consistent, okay? Different people think differently and they evaluate differently. They look at the exact same sentence and they have the same career field and they say something diametrically opposed to each other. Yep. Um, and that is what evaluation is about. Okay? That is real about. And, and so what, what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to assess, hey, we're at the midpoint. These are what we've come up with. Who's saying what? Why are you saying it? Now, currently, that is a very manual process. It happens. All those sanity checks and cross checks happen. It is super manual, and it takes a lot of time. And, and that is a piece that I really appreciate about what, what you're doing with your career. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. Thanks for that, Ben. Maybe uh, maybe you could put yourself on mute for just a second, and I think your smoothie's almost ready. Um, no, I, I think we've uh, I think we've beat that horse about you know how valid eval saves time and money, right? Um, it simplifies the the evaluation process. But when you when you think in terms of you know government acquisition professionals um, operating in a um, in a you know an, an environment where they're trying to mitigate risk you know, have defensible decisions, avoid the protests, um, leaving the life raft of what they've done in the past and going to a new tool or a new process. Let's talk a little bit about trust. Let's talk a little bit about confidence in the, in the system. I know, uh, Adam, that, you know, as we evaluated you and, and, and ended up working with you, um, you can see that the adoption of, of valid eval is is exponential. Um, over the last three years, the Army alone, I think, has done over 100 cohorts um, and uh, a lot of evaluations. So talk a little bit about trust, talk a little bit about adoption at the government level, because I think that's important. Yeah, so there, um, there's actually a, an interesting, um, I've got a presentation I've got to make in Austin here in a little bit, um, and so I actually pulled some numbers from the uh, National Defense um, Industry Association, the NDIA. And it's interesting, the, one of the top challenges that NDIA members cite is the burden of acquisition paperwork on the one hand, and then the need to streamline the acquisition process is uh, the most important thing, says industry about DOD. The, um, so I know that that's not trust exactly, but, um, but there's a bigger problem here that NDIA and others are silent on in terms of how to solve it. And that is the, the dramatic um, shrinking of the defense industrial base. And so I think um, you know, many, many, of the, many of the folks tuning in uh, to, 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 to this video uh, will be painfully aware of the fact that there has been a dramatic drop off in participation with the Pentagon uh, from the private sector at a time where we need the opposite to be true. We need we need America's best ideas if we're going to continue to be the arsenal of democracy and and have a hope of outpacing uh, some very aggressive peer and near peer rivals. Uh, we've got to get our act together. And if you go out into innovation uh, ecosystems, uh, whether it's Silicon Valley or Austin or you know Denver. The Detroit area, um, there isn't a very high level of trust. I, I would argue that the DOD's reputation as uh, as a business partner is, is, if not abysmal, close to. And part of that is that with the status quo processes out there, 
if I from industry see a topic or an opportunity um, to deploy my technology in, in a way that is hopefully going to serve my country, and all I get in return is a non-select letter that in two very polite paragraphs tells me nothing about why I didn't get that award, it doesn't exactly engender trust. So the perception from many in industry, too many, way too many in industry, in my view, is that the process is opaque, uh, that uh, DOD doesn't know what it's doing, it's too slow. And all of the stuff that you were talking about earlier, Ben, guess what? Private industry, A, doesn't get it, B, doesn't care. They just want their freaking decision and they want to know why they didn't, they, they, they didn't get the thing that they worked so hard to get. And, and so ameliorating this trust problem, I, I would argue, is a necessary precondition to inviting people back in to the defense innovation base and arresting that decline and indeed uh, rapidly growing it. You, you, you were talking about exponential growth, Mark. One of, one of the metrics that I hope uh, uh, the Honorable Heidi Hsu and others will keep their eyes on is the rate of growth or decline in the defense industrial base, because I think that's going to be a leading indicator of our country's ability to, to, to stave off conflict with, with people that, that wish us ill. So in providing a very transparent, very easy to understand, and very rapid process by which people not only get their decisions, they feel like the process had integrity, that DOD was an honest broker, they got treated fairly, and oh, by the way, they got their decision fast. And furthermore, and best of all, from my perspective, go back to my origin story. They get feedback so valuable that it is not available anywhere in this economy at any price. So if I can give that back to industry and I can do so rapidly, even though it's the answer is, hey, it's a no. If we can turn no into not this time but come back and re-attack better, stronger, faster with the benefit of the feedback that you got from some deeply expert, badass government people. Maybe we can solve this trust thing. Yeah. No, that's a good point, Adam. You know, as a previous DATSI member, um, we proposed on a good number of projects and didn't receive an award. Okay, that's, that's fine. Not everybody gets a ribbon. Um, However, we never received constructive feedback from the evaluation process. Like you said, it was opaque. It was just a black hole. You, you, you submit and then you get the nice letter. You didn't, you didn't yep. get down selected. But when SAE Government Technologies employed Valid Eval, they evaluate our technical scouting competition in late 2022. I was not only impressed with the ease of use of the capability, but also the feedback that the Valid Eval process provided to the companies that we did not select. So they understood maybe where they had some deficiencies or where they could do better. And, and I think when you talk about the strength of the industrial base, if you just say no, not now, it doesn't help them. It doesn't strengthen the industrial base to get better, to go do their homework and come back next time and you know, sharpen the tools and, and, and go after it and get after it in a, in a better way. It makes the industrial base better. It, it, at, least, it at least solves the trust problem, right? Uh, you, can't, you can't make people take the feedback. Um, but the fact that the feedback is there, it makes sense. It's structured with their learning in mind. Because keep in mind, where, where is the science of this coming from? The field of the learning sciences, right? That's what everything here is based on. So we, we do well, I think, to think about the defense industrial base as a community of practice, right? Those of us that are here in this space and are participating are, are doing so out of a sense of duty to our country. We're all here serving. Uh, not all of us are in uniform, uh, not all of us are DOD employees, but the mission is the same. It's to protect our country, to protect our kids, to protect our grandkids. And so that's that's what this is all about. Um, if we can come together as a community and treat this as an opportunity to constantly learn as a community how we can all be better in all phases of the game, I, th I think we're much better served and I think we'll be a safer country. Thanks, Adam. Let's, let's look at the other side of trust. So you're an acquisition professional mm -hmm. and you're using this new online portal. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about your, from your view and, and the adoption and the use of, of this, this portal by government acquisition people. Um, talk about trust from their perspective. Sure. Well, trust in the government context often looks a lot like past performance, right? There's a, uh, 
something something I've shamelessly stolen uh, from from a friend here uh, in in this community, and that and that is that uh, you know there are a lot of occasions where people act like penguins standing on the edge of the ice flow. No penguin wants to be the first penguin into the water, right? Because there's leopard seals and Lord knows what else in there that's going to eat them. But they're happy to be the 10th or the 11th or the 12th penguin in because there's some safety in numbers, right? So no one wants to be the first penguin. So we've solved the first penguin problem for the government, which is great, right? So now there's there's quite a few penguins in the water and, uh, you know, leopard seal is probably going to eat the other guy. Uh, so you'll be okay. Um, so the, uh, the 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 past the past performance is pretty key. I think that uh, you know some some of the relevant stats there. We're now managing about six and a half billion dollars in government programs um, flow flow through our tools. So so that's a pretty good deal. Um, you know, CPARS is another place where uh, where where appropriately credentialed uh, gubbies can can go check us out, and I think they're going to like what they see there about valid eval. Um, and, and but but really, I think the 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 way that we have um, the way that we have grown is purely by word of, word of mouth, and it's purely by people trying our tool and experiencing it and saying, "Oh my goodness!" Uh, then they tell their acquisition friends or their program manager friends that, "Hey, this thing is probably worth a look." And without exception, we have always started with one person that's willing to take, you know, one one little bet on us. Like, hey, we'll try this valid eval thing out in one little corner of, of our particular government program world. And if it doesn't work out, that's OK. And then they quickly become addicted. So without exception, we've always landed and expanded. Um, but it's funny because, um, you know, just because an army uh, assault penguin it, or uh, 10 of them are in the water, it doesn't follow that the Air Force penguins think that the army penguins are, are, are also penguins. <laughs> So that's been a thing, right? I mean, it is still it is still really siloed. And even though we're say, solving the exact same problem, whether it's Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, Department of the Air Force, uh, you know, or, or the Army, uh, people people are convinced that uh, that their little penguin suit's different than the other guys, and and therefore uh, they're they're a little nervous at first. Yeah, Ben, what are your thoughts on on trust from the government perspective? Yeah, I, Adam's spot on on that last comment, and it's uh, it. In my experience, it's down down the hall is a different world from where you're sitting. So, you know, it's not just the services in DoD. It's just it's not just the different locations. It could be it could be at your own command. Um, hey, those guys down the call, they don't know what the hell they're doing. We know what we're doing, right? Um, and so DOD is a big place and it's a disparate place and it's a place of disparate cultures yep. um, and the levels of trust are different. And so um, where I see adoption, I mean, ultimately we're talking about adoption here. Um, the, the tool's gotten a lot of adoption. Um, as Adam said earlier, though, it's gotten a lot of adoption at the lower TRL levels, right? With the, with the folks who are forward leaders, right? The, the folks at the early TRL levels are really to take a little bit more chances than the folks at the later TRL levels. What I love about this SAE relationship is that SAE bridges that gap. SAE goes from, hey, we're doing some basic research. We're doing some prototyping. Hey, we're doing some test and evaluation. And oh, by the way, we have systems that are moving on. To, I say we like, like I own SAE or something. But, um, but you know, you have systems that have gone through the process and are in production, right? And are going to still go through those evaluations, but you have to grow those relationships. So if you want, if you want the source selection team, remember I said, I called it a ritual. Those might be my words, but I would say a lot of people would agree with that. Source selection is a ritual. People yeah. feel it. They know how they felt at the last one. Yeah, there's some documentation on it, but people have a way of doing it. Right. right. Um, there are source selection center of, exec of excellence across, you know, the, the services. Those are folks that they live in the ritual. That's what they do. Right. Um, and so if you want people on the ritual to say, you know what, using this tool would be great for this billion dollar production buy. They have to get comfortable somewhere. And so getting comfortable in a prototyping effort or in a test effort um, and getting to love the tool, getting to know what it can do um, is super key to building that trust. You have to build it somewhere. Um, but land and expand, there's a lot of landings that happen to DOD, right? Uh, yep. you, have to, 
He has to land at a lot of different places, get them comfortable at a level, and then expand to it. And but partners make it happen. So you know this SAE partnership, the other partnerships that Valid Eval has built that I'm aware of. Um, that's the key. You get some champions on the inside, and then they work it for you. Yeah. Thanks, Ben, for your for your perspective. Um, the other thing. You look that, how I, I I commandeered SAE for myself at some point in that in those ramblings. Yeah, that's fine. Come on, you can, you, <laughs> come on aboard. Um, I, I guess my experience with the valid eval tool, the other thing that that sort of jumped out at me is um, I went through the evaluation process as as a judge uh, last fall. Is the scalability of it? It doesn't matter if you have thirty proposals or three or 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 whatever, and it doesn't really matter how many judges you have. Um, it's um, you know, it's the same process if it's a million dollar project or a, a one billion dollar project. Um, and I think that's really elegant that you that this this standardized process can scale infinitely. Um, uh, Adam, maybe maybe you can speak a little bit to the scalability of it. Yeah, in, in, infinity is a big subject uh, with small children in my house right now. So <laughs> I'm not going to claim infinite. Um, for 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 very for very sound reasons, but uh, but no, you're you're exactly right. It is it is the scale um, that uh, that that is kind of the magic here. And when we're talking to people that are curious about our tool, I, I often invoke the kitchen table rule, uh, which is to say, if all of the stakeholders, if all of your experts um, can fit around your kitchen table, you don't need a tool. Human beings are very good at at making group decisions in small groups. Where the wheels fall off the bus is when that group can no longer fit around the kitchen table. Um, so I, I can I can never remember. Help, help me out here, Mark. Um, how many how many technical subject matter experts would you say are, are members of SAE? Oh gosh, um, I mean, if you think in terms of committees, councils, you know, uh, task forces, um, I think the number is north of one hundred and forty thousand. So 100, 140,000 people, I mean, with, and this, this is what is so exciting about our work together for me, right? Imagine if there was a way to productively harness 140,000 deeply badass experts. Now, not every, not every you know, OTA opportunity that rolls through your consortium is going to be a fit. Uh, for, for everyone, right? In fact, it's going to be kind of narrow casting, like different opportunities are going to fit different pockets of expertise. And But you guys know how to solve that problem. Right. But the point is that if someone from SAE um, who is, you know, maybe working for GM or, um, or, or, or uh, an automotive supplier um, in the Michigan area, a deeply, deeply expert human uh, has been doing great things for their entire career, if they have an opportunity to serve their country by helping the army do some assessment where their unique expertise can be levered and deployed for the good of the country. And oh, by the way, they get to do it on their schedule over, say, a two week period where you guys have the judging window open and they can do it on their couch, maybe with a beverage in their hand if they want. Um, that's a pretty neat way to be able to serve your country. And oh, by the way, we routinely close the loop on the value add that these experts are bringing to the party. And it's not uncommon at all for the implicit value of those people to be north of $1,000 an hour. And so there's a lot of ways to serve, uh, to serve your community, to serve your country. But rare is the opportunity where your expertise can be deployed uh, with an impact of $1,000-ish an hour. Um, so that to me gets pretty attractive. And again, if we properly codify commander's intent, if it's a, a combat a combat vehicle concept of some sort that, that we're trying to get expertise on, and maybe you need some suspension people to come uh, and, and look at a component design for that. It's really pretty amazing to be able to scale that with confidence that commander's intent has been captured. And now we can also have those technical SMEs in here. And we can do so with the scale that only a software as a service platform can deliver. Exactly. Exactly. Ben, you have a comment? It's, it's, it's vacuum, guys. <laughs> my, my vacuum cleaner does. Um, 
No, no, I don't have a comment. I want to get on. I want to get on to some of our other points that I was hoping we would get to on here. Um, so I'll let, I'll let you go to your questions before I hijack you. No, it's fine. Um, late for that, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Ben. We're 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 about ready to wrap up. I want you to get your points out there. My goodness, sounds like you're uh, you're making lumber. <laughs> He's in a sawmill. <laughs> um, I'll just I'll just take a minute and talk about you know mission performance because um, as uh, SAE Government Technologies and in our consortium um, across you know eight technology focus areas, you know we collaborate with the government, industry, and university to solve mobility uh, challenges with with Army modernization, so tactical and combat vehicles, right? It could be uh, advanced energy storage, cybersecurity solutions, safety systems, suspensions. And to your point, Adam, um, when you have a pool of subject matter experts of that magnitude um, that are volunteering their time because they want to contribute their expertise in, in very specific focused ways, we can find those folks and assemble them in, into the portal, into the valid eval process um, to ensure that these subject matter experts are evaluating these solutions, these proposed solutions um, with, with, with the best technical capability, right? And, and I think that that's gonna be um, a very effective and elegant way um, to bring projects, or sorry, bring technologies to the government um, that is gonna be the best solution for the warfighter, right? More competition, best evaluations, have a standardized process, have a customized rubric and, and evaluation criteria um, that scales, right, up and down. Um, I just see this as a very effective way in, in bringing tremendous value to, to the warfighter. I, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you for saying so. I think that you know, there's, there's, there's one judge archetype here, one stakeholder group that we haven't talked about uh, directly. So we talked a lot uh, about acquisition professionals and what it is that they need and, and you know, time savings and, and protest hardening and all that good stuff. We've talked uh, now at some length about subject matter experts. There's a third very important group here, and those groups are the end users slash warfighters. And I hope some of those folks are, have, have, have stuck with us to, to the, towards the end of this broadcast to, to hear uh, their names invoked. because. The, as we're developing programs, as we're developing solutions, a trap that many otherwise well-intentioned DOD program managers and acquisition professionals can fall into is making what they think are the best decisions on behalf of the warfighter without freaking involving the warfighter in the process. So the same stuff that we've been talking about in terms of scalability can also close the loop on, do you actually want to use this? Um, and a, a wonderful counterexample of this is the $500 million or so that the government has spent on Microsoft for the HoloLens reconfigure goggle thing uh, for a co combat heads up display on a, on a soldier's goggles. Soldiers effing hate it. It's an awful system. It's not enhancing their performance in the field. And, I, you know, I, I'm not read in onto the whys and wherefores of how those decisions were made. This was not a valid eval program. Um, however, I have to believe that if early versions of that product were evaluated and tested with the warfighter uh, at the table, we wouldn't have wasted so much time and money on this program. Good point. Yeah, a piece on that. Um, and so, you know, early on, um, in early on in the DATSI, I'm going to go back in time to the DATSI day. So there, there was a time when I was on the government side, um, way before Mark was around. Um, and we did some fantastic outreach stuff um, with end users on these systems. Um, currently, I'm seeing this activity, and this is why I think it's so important to bring products like Valid Evil back to that customer base where I came from. Um, because modernizing tools and, and democratized tools like a, like a valid eval, where I can have the end user in, 
I can have an evaluation team. I can have the end user actively engaged in the evaluation. Um, I can weight them differently. I can, I can put focus on, oh, this one has a demand signal. You know, that, that's very important to me on, on whether there's a transition pathway. Do folks like it? Are they going to use it? Right. That's your example you just gave. Um, all of those things that are we can use. Oh, I, th I thought Adam was talking to me, but he was double no, muted. I, I'm, I'm getting some static about a car that won't start. So it's not as annoying as your vacuum, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I got I got three kids at, at home as well, Adam. So you got to do what you got to do. Um, but the, but you can use these tools to have the end user involved the whole way through yep. giving their input and they can give you the most valuable input because you can be halfway through and they can say, Hey guys, I got bad news for you. I wouldn't use this. Right. Yep. But at least, you know, at least, you yep. know, Hey, yep. this isn't going the way we thought it. And especially in the R and D and prototyping world that happens and it's going to happen and, and you need to be able to catch it at an early time. Yeah. And so look, if, if you can divine a system whereby the contracting people are happy, they're involved from the jump, the subject matter experts are convinced that this is not a solution that's gonna violate any of the laws of thermodynamics. And in fact, it has a reasonable technical risk profile to it. We probably actually could deploy this thing. And then you get a clear and unambiguous demand signal from the people that are actually going to be using this thing, whether they're civilian end users or warfighters, you've got a really good shot at actually transitioning the technology in question and in actually deploying something that's going to matter, that's going to keep our country safe. Absolutely. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for your time today. I think we're, uh, we're getting toward the end of our, of our time. Um, I think your perspectives of, about this elegant tool um, are fantastic. Um, I'm excited to employ this tool uh, going forward. And I think it's going to, uh, really bring tremendous value to to our government customers. So really appreciate your your uh, contributions, Adam. Um, it was a pleasure working with you on the last competition. I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you and your staff going forward. Ben, your government perspective is always always very valued. And, and so I, I, I want to say thank you to you both uh, for spending time with us today. Again, this LinkedIn live event uh, will, will go live actually next Tuesday, the 7th. Uh, I believe it'll be 2 p.m., um, but stay tuned. Again, thanks, thanks to you both. All right, thanks, Thank Mark. you, Mark.